uh, <clears throat> yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for uh, coming for this wonderful talk by Professor Michael Stevenson. Uh, I'm joining from Canada, and uh, with me it's uh, 6 a.m. in the morning. Mike is in England. Uh, it's 1 p.m., and then we have a couple of participants and colleagues from different parts of the world, particularly Pakistan. So uh, Mike uh, uh, has an extensive experience in the energy and geological science and research, including eight years national level science leadership as a UK's chief geologist. Uh, 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 he was working in the capacity of executive chief uh, scientist uh, at the British Geological Survey. Mike has been providing geoscience advice to the government for almost 15 years and has an excellent overview of the government's policies industrial activity, <clears throat> funding landscape, and the applied and energy geoscience, including CCUCS, shell gas, geological radioactive, disposal of geoscience and geoscience data. Mike has also expertise in positioning organizations in controversial energy topics, for example, shale gas and nuclear. Mike was advisor to send Mark on the Shell Gas and CCUSS in 2016, chair of the BISE Infrastructure Energy Data Expert Group 2013 to 2014, member UKRI's Energy Strategy Advisory Committee 2020 to 2021, and a member of the Royal Society, Royal Academy of Engineering, Shell Gas Steering Group, and a member of the government's hydrogen Advisory Council 2021. Widely recognized as an excellent scientist, Mike has over 100 peer-reviewed scientific papers and more than 200 conference abstracts. In addition, he was the chief editor of the Alstiver Science Journal for 12 years. His science excellence is recognized in his status as a professor at four universities. He is visiting professor at the University of Nanjiang, China, the University of Milan, Italy, and honorary professor at the University of Nottingham and Leicester, UK. Mike is a well-known communicator of science and, and has published three single author popular science books, which of which one is award-winning and delivered high-profile lectures, for example, the UK's parliament and has been a science advisor for BBC's Horizon and Bang Goes the th Theory programs. Mike, today I'll be talking about the high resolution stratigraphy of argillaceous rocks using combined palynology, palynofacial, and isotopic techniques. So I'll, I'll thank Mike, everyone, uh, on, on everyone's behalf. And uh, Mike, over to you for, uh, for the talk. Okay, thanks, Irfan. I hope uh, everybody can hear me. Um, uh, so today I'm going to talk for maybe 40 minutes or so about um, high resolution stratigraphy. Um, I'm a palynologist uh, and stratigrapher, but what I've done over the years is learned how to use other techniques like palynofascies and particularly isotope techniques in stratigraphy. So this is not going to be a talk um, about uh, fancy academic stuff. It's a very practical talk about how to use these techniques together to get better results in correlation or in paleoenvironmental studies. So it's a very practical talk this. So I hope uh, I hope you enjoy it and uh, hope I can answer your questions at the end. So um, the first thing is um, sedimentary organic matter, which is kind of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, we're all used to seeing it if we are a uh, Economic geologists, we're used to seeing it in core, so you can see some organic material here in uh, a core. This is taken at right angles to the uh, bedding direction. It's from the Paleocene, Neocene thermal maximum. You can see some core here. This is what the S sedimentary or organic matter looks like. If you are used to working in palynology or in other areas, then you, you might used to be used to seeing organic matter in palynological slides. You can see woody material and tissues and spores and amorphous organic matter. <clears throat> the point is we're used to seeing this sedimentary organic matter, but how can we use its properties to get better results in correlation 
and paleoenvironmental reconstruction. And that's what this talk is really about, using all the methods you can to improve your correlation and dating and paleoenvironmental reconstruction. So the contents are very simple, really. I'm going to just go through some of the ways that we can get information from sedimentary organic matter. And then I'm going to go through some examples of innovative com uh, combinations of techniques for better correlation. So this is really is a talk about how you combine techniques. It's not about one single technique. So I'm going to show you some examples from mixed carboniferous plastic uh, carbonate succession, Paleocene, Eocene plastic succession, Devonian, Lacustrine plastic succession, and then a carboniferous mudstone succession as well, and then give you some conclusions. And you can see the main prog uh, the main examples here are all published, so the the papers are there. If you're interested in reading the papers for more detail, then contact me at the end of the talk and I can send you the papers in PDF. But so all the material I'm going to talk about is published. There's nothing, uh, nothing confidential. So papers from the Journal of Geological Society, from Earth and Planetary Science Letters, Earth Science Reviews and uh, Review of Paleobotany and Palynology. Most of these uh, I was the first to author on, but a couple of these are from uh, papers um, are papers which were first authored by PhD students of mine. So first of all, let's go through some of the ways we can get at information from sedimentary organic matter. We all know what it is. And this is just a brief summary of how you can get information out of it. So one, one is palynology and palynofascies. So if you're not a palynologist uh, or a paleontologist, then really palynology is just spores and pollen. The, the, um, the fossils of spores and pollen, which are very durable, which last a long time in rocks. And basically, to get them out of the rock, you take the rock, here's a piece of argillaceous rock, you put it into a, a fume cupboard like this, you dissolve it, uh, the rock in um, usually hydro hydrofluoric acid or other acids, um, which essentially removes the siliciclastic material and uh, relieves a residue of organic material. So that's really all you do. And then you put the residue of organic material, which is in these bottles here, you mount it on a slide. And you can study the spores and pollen, but you can also study the other organic material, which is not spores and pollen, which is generally known as the study of palynofasces, which is I'm going to show you some exam details, examples of in a minute. And everybody knows that if you use palynology, you can use it to correlate like this in this area here. This is normal. You can correlate quite precisely. Occasionally you can't though. Now again, this is one of the topics of this talk is to show you how if you don't have high resolution palynology, how you can still get by without having that. So that's the first way that you can get at information in sedimentary organic matter. The second way is, again, a way that many of us will have used or known, have known about, which is aspects of organic geochemistry, so rocky val, uh, and using that to develop van Crevelin ratios and kerogen types. Many of us will have studied this kind of um, um, information that you get from argillaceous sedimentary rocks. So again, it can be used to characterize um, environments that can sometimes be used to correlate as well. You can use the organic matter in argillaceous sedimentary rocks also for organic geochemistry of biomarkers. So for example, using material you get to look at hopane sterane, uh, ratios and other ratios which help, help you to establish whether something is, for example, lacustrine or marine. So again, these are techniques or abilities that you can use to characterize environment and sometimes to correlate as well. The one I'm going to talk about in quite a lot of detail, mainly because I've used it a lot in uh, collaboration or in uh, direct comparison with palynology, and that's carbon isotopes. 
And the isotopes we're dealing with here is the delta 13C, so the, the ratio of carbon 12 to 13 in organic matter, which is why it's called delta 13C org. So the, this is the organic matter, not the carbonate material. So we're not dealing with carbonate isotopes here, we're dealing with the delta 13C, 12, 13, a ratio of uh, the carbon in organic matter. So there's a few important points here I need to make before I start the talk properly. So first of all, it's important to realize that although plants uh, decay and then become organic matter or material in the oceans become organic matter, they prefer preferentially take carbon-12. So plant growth tends to cause a corresponding rise in delta-13 as more carbon-12 is locked up in plants. And that affects the atmosphere, which affects the ratio of carbon-12 to 13 that the plant uh, absorbs when, it, uh, when it's continuing to grow. So really carbon-13, delta-13 carbon is a very useful indicator of the carbon cycle because it's telling you about large scale changes in how plants take up carbon in photosynthesis and how they bury it. So big things like glaciations, which uh, basically bury uh, or re reduce the amount of plant growth have an effect on the carbon cycle. And so you see that in the delta 13C of organic matter. So it, it's important to realize that delta 13C has a, is influenced by the, the global carbon cycle, the geological carbon cycle, and therefore can tell you things about climate change, for example. But the other thing that's really important is it's also strongly influenced by the composition of the organic matter that you're dealing with. And we have to remember that in a rock, organic matter can come from lots of different uh, sources. So particularly the ratio of marine organic matter to terrestrial organic matter is really important for the bulk delta 13C organic matter signature. Where you have a lot of terrestrial organic matter, you have a different signature to what you have if you have a lot of marine organic matter. The reason for this is, at least in the Paleozoic and Mesozoic, delta 13C org of marine organic matter is about minus 30 per mil while terrestrial delta 13C org is around minus 23 to minus 25. And that's really important. And I'll show you why uh, in the next slide. So if, if we take this slide here of, of um, sedimentary organic matter, what you have in it is uh, quite a lot of woody material. That's the dark stuff, dark pieces of wood. So from you know, ancient woodland, uh, you know, from the Carboniferous or the Permian period. And this would have a ratio, a del 13 C org ratio of minus 23 to minus 25 per mil, this level here. However, amorphous organic matter, which is again in this slide, present in this slide, that kind of mushy, fluffy stuff, has a, a delta 13 C value of about minus 30 per mil. So the total organic matter of the whole of this slide, if you like, of this is a, a blend of the two, depending on the relative masses of the two. So a lot of marine organic matter will tend to send the ratio to the lower the ratio. A lot of terrestrial will tend to um, make the ratio slightly higher, closer to 23 or 25 per mil. I know this is a bit difficult to grasp if you haven't studied it before, but it's important because I will show you how it can be used alongside palynology in a minute. So just to, to summarize that, so there are different reasons for variations in delta 13C org upper section. So if you have a section of sedimentary rocks here with some um, terrestrial fascias and the blue marine fascias, then the variation that you've got here from minus 23 to minus 30 could be just because you have a marine trend, so you have more marine organic matter than terrestrial organic matter in the rock. So your delta 13 C org there could be entirely to do with marine terrestrial environment changes, so purely environmentally controlled in quite a small scale. However, you could also have 
the same pattern being accounted for by large scale carbon cycle changes. So essentially big scale burial or release of carbon in the geological carbon cycle can cause these sorts of changes as well. And often it's quite hard between, to tell between the two because um, it's hard to unravel which one is operating at this point. And again, what I'm going to show you is some advanced or sort of clever methods with Delta 13C org associated with palynology, which, which can help you check that. So for example, you can sieve the residue. So this stuff that we saw here before, we can use a simple sieve to sieve out the larger woody material and just do Delta 13C measurements on the wood alone, which would give you a check because that's uh, only wood and therefore any change that you get would be presumably to do with large scale geological climate changes or, or carbon cycle changes as opposed to smaller scale local marine to terrestrial changes because this is all wood and therefore it's only a terrestrial signal. So it, it can't be to do with um, variation in the amount of marine to terrestrial. So in this case here, that trend could be both climate change because that's what you're seeing here in the wood but it, because you've got more than the change re recorded in the wood, it, it also could be a marine change, marine trend. So you could have both uh, climate change, like uh, deglaciation could cause a marine transgression. So you get both at the same time. So it's quite important. So the point I'm trying to get to here is these techniques can be used on single samples representing different stratigraphic levels, split for different uses. So if we take a series of samples here, depth in a core, we can take a rock sample like this, break it into two, and then do palynofasces on one side and delta 13 C org on the other. And I'll show you how that is really quite powerful, much more powerful often than just palynology on its own or delta 13 C org on its own. And the important thing here to realize if you're uh, working in the um, economic geology industry, um, is these techniques are not expensive. Palynology itself is a cheap, uh, a cheap technique, it's usually less than $150 a sample. Palynofasces is part of that service. Delta 13C org is usually pretty cheap, usually less than $100 a sample. Things like biomarkers are also can be cheap depending on what you're doing. Palynology can be used for correlation and paleoenvironment. Palynofasces can also be used for these things as well. But the point about this talk is what I'm going to show you is how joining them together, these techniques can be really good, much better than one technique on its own. So this is really how it works, and it's really a workflow as opposed to a, a single technique. So you start with your argillaceous rock sample, you break it into two, you do isotope processing on one side, and you do palynological processing on the other side. So using palynological processing, you get an organic residue, which I showed you before. You can store that residue in a bottle and use it many, many years later. So the BGS, where I used to work, had something like 87,000 bottles of organic matter residue from 50 years of palynological research, which is an extraordinary resource. You can also make palynofasci slides, which I'll show you very useful. You can make palynology slides. You can also do biomarker analysis on the organic residue released from palynological processing. The other important thing is you can use the organic residue, as I hinted earlier, to separate wood, say woody material, which is tends to be larger, or AOM, and do isotope processing only on the wood or the AOM. So you're essentially making isotope measurements or using isotope methods on parts of the sedimentary organic matter that you have chosen for a particular reason. So you can have delta 13C wood, delta 13C AOM. AOM is amorphous organic matter. You can produce your detailed material and then work on your correlation. But from isotope processes, you can do bulk 
D13C, which is essentially the whole of the organic matter material, as opposed to just the wood or the air, and that has its value too. This I'll talk about in a minute because it's a, an extra thing that you can also do in isotope processing. So this is really what this talk is about. I'm going to show you examples of these methods and how they help us to gain really high resolution results sometimes. So some examples. First of all, let's talk a bit about the UK Carboniferous. It's the lower Carboniferous, and I'm going to show you how Palinofasci's Palinology Delta 13C can be used together. So an example from the UK Carboniferous, the lower Carboniferous. It's an area in the northeast of England uh, near Newcastle, uh, Throckley Borehole and the Roland Gill Borehole, two boreholes. This was published quite a long time ago, but um, still useful. And here are the two sections from the two boreholes, Throckley and the Roland Gills borehole. What you notice, first of all, is that it's a mixed clastic carbon section, so it has some limestones and others. There's some macrofossil and microfossil correlation evidence, but not, not particularly good. So it's quite hard to identify these uh, layers and to correlate them. Even correlating between the boreholes is sometimes difficult unless you assume something of a thickness of limestone is the same limestone, so essentially lithofascies. Palynology is OK, but actually, if you actually look at the size of the palynology zones, this is the TK zone. Uh, in this area, it's unless you have special extra information, your biozone really covers uh, quite a lot of the stratigraphy, so not particularly useful if you're looking to try to correlate or or identify at a high resolution. So what I'm going to show you is how we use palynology and isotopes together to develop a better feel for that. So the first thing we did was we took one of the balls, Throckley, and we did delta 13C bulk. So that's basically this path here, if you can see that. So we started with the sample, we did all the palynology, the palynofascies on this side, but for the same samples we also did the bulk delta 13C, so we got this these figures here. What those figures show effectively is a kind of descending trend from minus 30 around to minus 23 or so, minus 22. Um, and you get these quite low levels in the limestones, which you could probably predict, as I suggested earlier, these are marine, therefore the organic matter is going to have this low delta 13C value of about minus 30 or so. So you can see that. So immediately you can see the limestones in the palynology residues because they have a lower delta 13C value. So this is a kind of marine trend, if you like. But in the non-marine, you also have a terrestrial trend which seems to be going this way. One thing we don't really know is, is that a, a marine, uh, is that a terrestrial marine mainly effect on the delta 13C bulk or is it a climate change effect? Is it what are we looking at here? What does this trend mean? So what we did to test that was we separated the woody material from the organic residue and we did delta 13C separately on that. So you can see the delta 13C of wood fragments here. And what you can see, though, it's not a hugely, not a perfect correlation, is again that decreasing trend. So that's just on wood. So it, it tends to suggest that what you're looking at is a, is a climate change trend. But on superimposed on top of it are these marine uh, intervals as well. So these, this trend is probably to do with a um, uh, change in, um, in the carbon cycle due actually to plants um, increasing their presence on, on land. It's a terrestrial colonization climate change, geological carbon cycle event. But what I've tried to show you is we've gone through this side of this workflow and we've also gone through this side as well. But we've also taken the wood and we've done, so we've done that, but we've also done that. So we've looked at the wood Delta 13C. So what you can see here is essentially a marine trend and a terrestrial trend. And what you can also see is if you do the Roland Gill borehole as well, you see the same trend, so the marine trend in those three limestones, the same terrestrial trend. 
So although you've only got a very um, poor feeling for it in terms of the palynology, uh, it doesn't really help you to distinguish in detail. You can make a fairly clear correlation based on this dis descending marine trend and terrestrial trend if you combine it with palynology. So you get, you get quite a, a good correlation. Of course, this correlation wouldn't work if you weren't sure that you were operating in rocks which are about the same age. Um, but what I'm showing is you is that the palynology helps you to identify the growth stratigraphy and then you can go in and use more uh, detailed techniques. But you have to test that what you're using is, um, is uh, you want to know whether you're dealing with a fascist influence or effect or a, a, a global carbon cycle effect. They're all within one palynological biozone. One of the things that we found out when we started doing this kind of work on delta 13c bulk and palynology was that there were some effects that hadn't really been written about in the literature. So this has helped us to understand delta 13c bulk a bit better. So this is a paper published in 2005. It's about two boreholes in Oman in the Middle East, uh, Talilat 16 and 42, both operated by Petroleum Development Oman. And we were looking at this, uh, these two sequences. Essentially, this is one of the sequences to Lida 42. We did very, very detailed lithology, lots of palynology, and lots of palynofasces. You can see palynology there, palynofasces there. And we also did the Delta 13C bulk. So this is simply using that method of taking the rock and, and, and looking at its delta 13c value of the bulk organic matter. And you can see some pretty big trends in this, which was interesting in terms of the palynology and palynofasces. But we also noticed that there was oil in the core, small amounts of very uh, large molecule bitumen, essentially, not, not, a, not mobile oil, but immobile bitumen which is found in some of the argillaceous layers. And what we found was if we cleaned that bitumen out of the rock, out of the samples, and ran the isotopes again, what we found is a very different signature. So what we essentially found was that an effect in oil-bearing rocks, which is not all that common, but an effect on the delta 13 c in oil-bearing rocks is the fact that Unbeknownst to you, some organic material, some bitumen or residual hydrocarbon can be present in the rock. And if that's the case, then you have to remove it in order to get a proper result for delta 13C. Otherwise, you're looking at essentially uh, delta 13C values of something foreign, something extraneous from the rock type. So this is very interesting. The same as two of the other wells. So this is the bulk signal before we removed any oil or any bitumen from the, the rock. And this is after, so you can see the huge change. In other words, you would think you were looking at a fascist effect or a climate change effect. In fact, you're not. You're looking at a, an effect much more to do with migrated hydrocarbons, which have remained in the rock and which have a very different delta 13 C value, which is affecting your, effect, your results. So this is when we actually took the bitumen out, we did some delta 13C on the on the actual uh, bitumen and you can see how low it is. So it's very interesting that this delta 13C is so is so very low that it's very, very distinctive. It actually is an indicator indicator of Hucker oil, which is very old Precambrian oil, which is generated in, in Oman. It's one of the oldest oils in existence. So it's a very low delta 13C value algal origin. So when it when it appears in your rock, it's going to affect your results a lot. So you have to remove it. The amount of deflection of delta 13 C to the left is roughly proportional to the amount of extracted bitumen. So you've got to be very careful to remove it if you think you're working in an area which has migrated uh, bitumens. So essentially what we're dealing with here is this little bit on the right here so isotope processing, recognition of bitumens in the samples, removal of the bitumen, and going round again to do the bulk again. So this, this cycle here has to be done if you think you're dealing with it. 
But once you've done that, you can be sure you're dealing with either a marine terrestrial signal or a, a carbon cycle signal. With some more specific, sophisticated examples. So this is from the UK North Sea, the Paleocene-Eocene boundary. It's the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum, actually. So here we use palynology and some quite complicated uh, Delta 13C org techniques in order to gain a lot of correlation accuracy and precision, but also some really extraordinary levels of uh, precision in empirical environmental study. So this is published in Earth and Planetary Science Letters. Um, if you're not aware of the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum, it's very famous. Uh, it's present in Pakistan, for example, it's present in Middle East, it's present in uh, pretty much uh, many, many areas of, of the world. Uh, it's this extraordinary period of very high temperatures uh, around the Paleocene Eocene boundary. It's you know, one of the warmest periods of time in the last sort of 500 million years uh, in, in the Phanerozoic, in fact. People are really interested in it because at the moment we know we've got injection of CO2 into the atmosphere. We know we've got changes that predict extreme temperature change. We, we know we're talking about high CO2 concentrations at this at the moment. Um, but the pattern was similar. And this is why people are interested in it, because it's maybe a way of looking at our present problem. So similar CO2 and temperature increase. And one of the great things about the petum is that some of the rechanges are preserved in the rocks so we can study it and try to understand our own problem using that. But it's also a really good place to show how powerful palynology and del 13 c org can be when you put them together. So I'm going to show you this. So this is what the petum looks like in core, in deep marine cores. It has this kind of brownish colour. In the North Sea, it has it's a, a kind of gamma spike, but also has very fine laminations, uh, very finely laminated uh, argillaceous rock. It has forums in it, it has dinoflagellates, it has a lot of geochemical evidence in it, which makes it interesting. Across the world, it's uh, quite well known that it has essentially a very marked change in Delta 13C org, which we know is not, uh, is not a terrestrial marine problem. It's um, more to do with global carbon cycling. So you can see this, what known as the CIE, the carbon isotope excursion, very big change in Delta 13C in organic and in carbonates in two places uh, in the world. In the North Sea, what you've got to realize is this is what the pattern looks like in core. Uh, this is the well we studied, 2210A4. It's in the middle of the North Sea. What you would realize at the time there was no real Atlantic that didn't exist uh, and the North Sea was also an embayment of the early Atlantic because uh, it wasn't, uh, it was sealed off in the south. So it was a, quite a different kind of sea at the time. This is what the stratigraphy looks like. So the, the spike is around here. This is the gamma spike that I mentioned. So the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum is here. And what we wanted to do was really study it from the point of, envir of environment as opposed to oil or gas or anything like that. But uh, so what we did was um, we took a lot of samples, a very large number of palynology and isotope samples. We did, as I suggested before, break them into two. So we had bulk isotope results and we had palynology results. And this is what the bulk looks like. So you have a very big a change from right to left here in this region, about sort of six or seven per mil. And this is again, as I've said, well known throughout the world. <clears throat> if you look at it in more detail, so this is actually from a smaller part of that. So what we did here, we really tried some sort of clever techniques with the organic matter. So we had organic matter that we had separated for palynology. It was in those bottles, it's a, a residue. So what we did was we sieved the residue and mechanically separated woody material, um, amorphous organic matter, uh, organic matter that was less than 30% wood and which was more than 30% wood. So if you remember my earlier slide where I mentioned how these things have an influence on the total 
delta 13 C value of the bulk. What we should have is AOM being mostly to the left because it has the lowest delta 13 C. And hey presto, it is. You can see that line is consistently to the left of the bulk line. That's because you are essentially measuring the end member of AOM. So the maximum marine organic matter content. This blue line is the bulk, so it's the average, if you like, or the, the blend. And if we go to the right, and we should expect it to be the right because that's where terrestrial organic matter sits, it should be a lower, sorry, a higher delta 13C value. And you can see that where it's less than 80% wood, you have this. Where it's green, this would be the highest you can get in terms of an end member to terrestrial input, you see the levels are uh, lowest, sorry, the highest delta 13 C values. So it's what we would expect. It's a, this was really good when we did this because it proved essentially what we were trying to understand all along, which was how organic matter is really a spectrum of contributors to the bulk value. And that spectrum is mixed together in a bulk value and separated when you can separately, me mechanically separate them. But again, the fact that they're all going to the left um, shows you that you're dealing with a, uh, a carbon cycle problem here as opposed to a terrestrial marine problem. And of course, we did some very detailed paleontology alongside that. So we were able to match uh, different sorts of paleontological data against precisely against particular characteristics of the uh, isotope change. So actually to be able to note how dinoflagellates changed at particular points in the in the CIE, for example. So this is really, really detailed. We're really talking about um, centimeter by centimeter paleontology. So a sort of stratigraphy, this is super high resolution. And also we're looking at angiosperm pollen and different sorts of other sorts of uh, paleontological data. In the end, what we were able to do is um, really take this apart. We were also actually on the same samples, even looking at things like kaolinite in the rock type. So again, it looks very expensive, but because you're only really doing two or three techniques on the same sample, which you simply break into two or three and give to three different labs, it's actually quite efficient. And because you're dealing with the same sample, you don't have to sort of cross color and correlate or anything. But what essentially we're able to do is show how Salinity changes in the North Sea uh, were probably being caused by um, increase, increased runoff. We we're also able to show um, changes in stratification um, uh, from reduced basin restriction, for example, as sea level rose. So a fantastically um, detailed deconstruction of a very, very fine stratigraphy. Let's jump now to another example. Um, this is um, very, very different. So we're doing going back some more than 400 million years to the Devonian. This time looking at palynology, palynophacids in Delta 13C in a Devonian succession. So this is the succession. This is the place. It's the Orcadian Lake. It's a series of lakes that existed in the Middle Devonian, roughly. Uh, this is the north of Scotland. You can just see here just in this part here. So these lakes in the Devonian had this, more or less this, um, this pattern in the Devonian. At that time, Scotland was between Laurentia and Baltica. These uh, rocks known as the um, uh, Caithness flagstones are famous for their beautiful fossil fish, for their highly laminated uh, sediments. Um, the reason why we were studying this was because um, of a nuclear uh, establishment was being developed, so nuclear power stations, uh, and they wanted to know what the rock type that the that the um, the power station would stand on. So we did some fairly detailed work on this. The thing about these Caithness flagstones is that although they have fish fossils in them, there are very few, and they're very very concentrated. So th these rocks are quite hard to correlate. Um, they actually are. Um, source rocks out in the North Sea, in parts of the North Sea. So they are of economic interest. 
but they're quite hard to correlate. Uh, one of the things is that the palynology, again, although you have palynology zones, but they're very large, and so the, almost the whole of the Caithness flagstone group is covered by one palynological biozone. So it, it makes it quite hard to correlate in detail between boreholes uh, underneath the underneath the power station in Caithness. And um, this is published in Earth Science Reviews, I think. So th these are the wonderful palynomorphs that you get. They're so very nicely, nice uh, sort of grapnel tipped uh, palynology. But this is the key thing that they're not very easy to correlate. However, over the years, um, painstaking work by Donovan, Fannin, Astin, geologists working in Orkney and Shetland and uh, north northeastern Scotland, recognized that there were 45 cycles, which associ were associated essentially with the 45 lakes, which grew and shrunk and grew and shrunk for many millions of years. So the Orcadian Lake was sometimes big, sometimes small. And it actually has annual laminations in it. But the key thing is each lake produced a cycle as it grew and then dried up and then grew and then dried up and grew and dried up. And there's something like 45 cycles, as I said. And what you can actually do is correlate by counting the cycles. Uh, and it's a bit like um, uh, using the uh, growth rings of trees. So you can use the patterns of thicknesses of groups of cycles to correlate. And you can use um, the sort of proxy of that, so the gamma ray logs, for example, which will give you something of the cycle. So what was given to us when we started with the work was within the two boreholes, it was thought that cycle 26, so the 26th cycle of the, the 26th lake of these uh, Devonian rocks was at 125 meters in Narex 2 borehole and 45 meters. But we weren't sure. We weren't sure. So this is a really a litho mythological correlation. So we were asked, can you show that these are the same? And of course, the first thing I tried was palynology. Palynology is OK, but it doesn't really provide for you. There's not enough palynomorphs in there beyond telling you that you are in the zone, the right zone, but it doesn't really help you to identify whether you've got cycle 26 or not. So we knew that from palynology, we were roughly in the right area. But what we would like, to, what we tried to do, therefore, was some isotope study. So this is the cycle that we looked at. We think it's 26. It's only 124 to 127. So this is only three meters of stratigraphy. We did a lot of isotopes, a lot of palynology samples. Here's the fasces and here's the delta 13C and percent carbon. The fasces shows essentially where the lake is deepest. So the lakes are deepest where you have this sort of carbonate laminite, which is uh, tends to indicate the deepest part of these Orcadian lakes. And then you have laminated sediments either side. It's all very laminated. So you're the deepest water of the lake around here, the lake's drying up and then it fills up again. So you get a new cycle above and uh, there's a cycle below. What you can see is that delta carbon, delta, th sorry, the percent carbon is uh, quite high, but it get, really gets highest uh, around the middle of the cycle because that's where the organic matter is best preserved. The delta 13C is interesting because it it sort of follows that, uh, but it also has a symmetrical pattern either side of the of the deepest part of the lake. So we were able straight away to have a, an understanding of this. Um, material. But what was interesting is when we did both of the cycles, sorry, both of the boreholes on cycle 26, was we got precisely, or pretty much exactly the same isotope um, signature. You can see the two C proposed on each other here on the same vertical scale. You can see it's almost exactly the same, which tends to suggest that we are dealing with the same cycle. We're only one kilometre apart here, and we're, really, we're only at a few thousand years of time here. Um, as to explain why, why this actually happens, that is quite a difficult problem to uh, to solve, why that increase happened there. But one of the my colleagues working on this suggested that in modern lakes, when lakes start to dry up and pH changes and salinity changes, um, algae switch 
from one type of metabolism to another, which tends to produce an isotope uh, excursion like that, which is something you see in modern lakes. So we, at the time, thought that this might be the reason for the Orcadian lake having that signature. But again, you can show how very high resolution correlation can occur um, by combining palynology and isotopes. So we've come to the last example now, which is uh, carbonif carboniferous mudstone succession. So this is a, an important succession, mainly because it is a it's quite probably quite um, prospective shale. So for shale gas, there was a time in the UK a few years ago where, where shale gas was uh, was being considered for for the UK. So this is uh, the area. It's uh, northern England. Uh, it's um, an area of uh, which has only one, again, one palynology biozone that covers it. So it's quite difficult to use palynology to to deeply or highly high precision correlate. Correlate. There are some good aminoids, but the aminoids are often not easy to use because um, you're dealing with core and you may not have the right aminoids preserved in the core. But the key thing about these rocks is that they are full of this kind of stuff. So not many spores or pollen, like no pollen, not many spores, just massive amounts of woody material and amorphous material. So really it was a big challenge to look at this and to think how do we correlate this, how do we understand it when it seems to be mostly material which is hard to recognize. So how really how do we use all this AOM is this the question that came up. So this is my student at the time, Sven Konitsa, who's uh, really took hold of this problem and, and, and tried to solve it and did a fantastic job. You can see the kind of material that you're dealing with. It's uh, kind of uh, amorphous. It uh, tends to be unstructured or structured in a way that we don't really understand. It's not really recognizable immediately. So it was a real big problem. So and this is what it might look like in detail. So you can see the kinds of material, not, not a spore inside here. And this is what the palynology samples are completely dominated by, just lots of material like this. But what um, Sven did and what I've been doing more recently is to really study this material. So to recognize that although it isn't a spore or, or pollen grain, it does have important information locked up inside it. So what essentially um, Sven did and what I'm doing now is was to able to recognize two kinds of amorphous organic matter. One called AOMGR, which is an example here, which if you look at and you really carefully analyze is essentially amorphous right down to its basics. It's, there's no structure in it, at least at microscopic level using a light microscope. Um, it has inclusions of plant fragments. It sometimes has pyrite in it, um, AOMGR, and then AOMBR, which, although superficially it looks similar in having what looks unstructured, when you look at it more closely, you begin to see that it actually is structured. It's just poorly structured, or the material is um, has go undergone quite a lot of degradation. So the difference between the two really is one, although it looks like amorphous organic matter and looks like it's marine, actually it's not. It's probably land plant derived material that has been bi microbially degraded. So it's been attacked by microbial activity in the water column or in the on the sea bed. And there are other things that we were also able to identify, obviously phytoclasts, which are woody material, sporomorphs, jellified organic matter. So this is the main, I think, um, advance in this area was to realize that you could, with careful microscopy, distinguish between essentially material which is algal in origin and material which is woody and terrestrial in origin, even though they look superficially similar. We were able to bear this out by looking at single particles using uh, scanning electron microscopy. And you can see on the left an AOMGR particle, which is has no structure, even when you go up to much higher levels of magnification, there's no obvious evidence of structure. You do get inclusions, which is probably algae falling through the water column, collecting pieces of wood as, the, as it falls down through the, the column. 
but essentially this stuff is is is, is amorphous. Whereas what again looks superficially similar, when you look at it, you can see structure in it. So you can see these ribs here, you can see this hard edge here. Then when you go to a higher magnification, you can actually see the xylem tissue. So this is woody material, it's not albin, though it looks like it at a lower magnification. So that was a, a big and important uh, change. So essentially you were able to identify two types of amorphous organic matter rather than one, which is what is usually done in, in this kind of panel study. And here's the ad, um, material, the other sorts of uh, material in there. So going to one of the sections, uh, again, we did an enormous amount of delta 13C value. We looked at TOC, you can see the TOC is higher in this section here than it is in this section. You can see the delta 13C also changes. It's lower here and slightly higher here. We did our separation, so this is actually woody fragments separated, and you can, you can see they are to the right, as you'd expect, and they show, uh, again, a fairly consistent pattern, as you'd expect, so there's not a climate change effect here. It's mostly, this is mostly uh, a fascist effect, the fact you've got lower delta 13C value in this upper blue part than in this browner part below. And if you have a look at the pattern of fasci, so here's AOMGR, which is the algal AOM, is the AOMBR, which is essentially the terrestrial material, looks like AOM. This is jellified organic material. This is these are phytoclasts. Of, this is spores, and this is algae. So what you can see essentially is two parts: the AOMBR and GR completely dominate the organic matter, as, as I said earlier. And this is AOMGR dominant. And this is land plant debris dominant. You can see it again from the phytoclasts here and the AOMGR as well. And this is really the reason why the delta 13C value is lower on this side and slightly higher down here. It also explains that the TOC is more related to AOMGR than it is to AOMBR or to the terrestrial organic matter, which is an important thing if you're looking at, say, shale gas prospectivity. In the end, what we were able to do is really uh, make a kind of model of what we're looking at. So we've got a, a basin which is more marine here, which has a higher uh, TOC value. It has AOMGR dominant and a lower part, which is has a lower delta 13, C, sorry, a higher delta 13 C value, lower TOC values, much lower you can see here. Uh, and that's land plant that debris dominated. You wouldn't be able to tell that if you hadn't been able to tell the difference between AOMGR and AOMBR. Okay, so I've gone over time a little bit, but essentially the conclusions are that I've tried to show you that fasces, lithology, cycles, valves, geophysical logs can all offer correlation at different levels of precision, but used in combination, especially with biostratigraphy, can provide high pre precision, and we know that. But it's interesting to note that using palynology on split samples, as I showed you earlier, using palynophysis alongside delta 13C org and palynology can provide even higher resolution. So one technique on its own, uh, you know, is some is good. But if you can use several, you can really get to high levels of. And this is not expensive. Essentially, you're dealing with a. Um, a workflow which involves taking a single sample and breaking it into pieces and separating it for different labs. Uh, and so what you get is a really powerful tool. You can also save the material in these little vials and use them later because the material doesn't really decay particularly. So you can get to levels of um, precision, thousands of years, less than a meter of a rock is possible using combined techniques like this. Okay, I'll stop there. So I'm available for, for consulting in these areas. So uh, if you're interested, don't hesitate to contact me by email or have a look at my website at any time. I'll just go back to the workflow diagram because I think that's perhaps the best summary of what, uh, what I'm trying to suggest here. Okay, so that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much, uh, Mike.
Uh, it was an interesting uh, talk, uh, um, a very good combination of uh, how the C and, our, and the isotope work together with polynophages. We have a question from uh, Dr. Hanif. Uh, please uh, turn on your microphone and uh, you can ask. Thank you, Dr. Irfan. Uh, uh, am I loud enough? Yeah. Yeah, we can hear. Okay. Thanks, Mike, for uh, such a nice uh, talk. Um, you have started uh, with the basics and then you have covered very excellently uh, to the application side and you have very uh, clearly explained how we can refine the results if you, someone is working on the bulk uh, organic matter. Uh, I have a couple of questions. I will try to be quick because other people will also be asking questions. So my first question is that uh, my thought, my thought about inorganic carbon, we believe that inorganic carbon is more, you know, <clears throat> is more uh, uh, heavier, uh, has uh, has a little uh, carbon twelve compared to terrestrial organic matter where we have enriched carbon twelve. But in, in the start, you have shown us that the marine organic matter is even uh, more depleted in carbon-13. Mm. Uh, so when we compare with inorganic carbon, the terrestrial organic matter is uh, more depleted in carbon-13 compared to inorganic one. But you showed us that the organic matter is even further depleted in carbon-13 compared to uh, terrestrial organic matter. Obviously, it has a link with the photosynthesis uh, and since we, you link that depletion of carbon-13 to the uh, marine algae, and uh, obviously it has a link with the photic zone. So in the photic zone, that means it is the, the, the mechanism lies in the uh, photosynthesis where we have this enrichment of carbon-12 of the marine algae more than the terrestrial organic matter. So I, I would like you to comment on that, whether is it because of that photosynthetic uh, process, uh, which is more efficient in the photic zone in marine system where the carbon-12 enrichment occur in the marine algae more than the terrestrial organic matter. And another question, which is somewhat related to this question is that if uh, it's not directly related, if someone is interested to work on the symbiotic uh, foraminifera, uh, which has symbiotic relationship with the phytoplanktons in the photic zones, Obviously, the phytoplanktons will take more carbon-12 and fix it in their bodies, and the, uh, the ontogenetic growth of the foraminifera will lead to more enrichment of carbon-13. Mm -hmm. So if someone is working on symbiotic uh, foraminifera uh, for paleoclimatic reconstruction, will it be biased because of that symbiotic relationship with the phytoplanktons? Yeah, two very technical questions, which it would probably be better to ask um, an isotope specialist or a biologist than a geologist. So really what I was trying to show you was um, how to use these. And frankly, although I've tried to understand why marine organic matter has a different general delta 13z value than terrestrial organic matter, I haven't really seen uh, a, a really good explanation. One of the interesting things about the Paleozoic and the Cenozoic is that marine and terrestrial have these particular values, but in more recent rocks, they're very different and they suddenly change. And again, um, it's quite hard if you look at the literature to see why that has happened, but I'm sure you're right. It has a, a root in the basics of photosynthesis, the basics of you know, biochemical processing in different sorts of organisms. Um, and in marine organic matter, all I can say is it's you know certainly true from you know hundreds and hundreds of studies that in the Paleozoic, for example, there's a really strong differentiation between terrestrial and marine. The explanation is is not forthcoming. Perhaps one of the reasons is that the algae that we're dealing with isn't preserved. I mean you saw from that shale study, the last one that I showed, how poorly preserved this material is that is producing the organic matter. It's, it's algae, probably. Uh, we've done some biomarker work on it, which suggests it's algae. Um, the kerogen suggests it's algae, things like um, 
uh, Van Crevelin work or um, whatever suggested algae, but um, you know, it's it's not even using really high highly powered scanning electron microscopy. You can't reveal any structures that indicate that without doubt it is an algae or algae of some sort. So I'm afraid I can't answer your question. I don't know why they are different, but I know that they are. And the, the fact that they are different is extremely useful. In the past, it's actually been a problem because people haven't realized that what they thought was a climate change signature was actually simply a fascist change. And that's really common in the in the literature where someone has interpreted a big isotope excursion as some sort of massive carbon cycle perturbation when it's actually just a marine to terrestrial transition or something similar. So I, I can't really answer you the same question on symbiosis. Um, I know people have worked on this, how, you know, changes in the position of the um, in the hierarchy of um, producers it affects the delta 13 C value of, of tissue. But um, I think you'd need to talk to a biochemist or a, or something like that to, to, to get a, a good answer. So sorry, I can't answer the, the second question. As I said, this talk was mainly aimed at people trying to correlate in more detail. So I'm really aiming at people who want to use it, not necessarily to understand it. It's certainly not aimed at climate change specialists, this talk. It's aimed at people who simply want to correlate and be better stratigraphers. Thank you, Ike. Thanks. Okay. Do we have any other question? No, I think we don't have any question. So, Mike, uh, uh, I would I would like to have uh, uh, for the audience, obviously. Uh, so, so uh, Fanula, I want to have a question. Oh, okay, yeah. Please Fanula. go go ahead. Yeah, yeah you can you can okay. Sir, thank you very much for such an informative talk. Uh, sir, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can hear you. Uh, sir, my question is uh, related to the basics of palynology. As you have mentioned that a palynological res residue can be kept for many years and can be re reused uh, whenever we need it. Uh, I want to ask that does the time factor affect the authenticity of palynological residue or not? Yeah, I mean, great, great question. Um, yeah, so um, no, it doesn't really. Uh, so for example, well, what you've got to realize is that these pollen and spores have existed in the rock for hundreds of millions of years often. For the Devonian example, you know, more than 400 million years. And yet, uh, and so being held in a bottle for a year or two is really not an effect at all. So uh, again, as I said, in BGS, uh, when I used to work there, we had residues from 50 years ago, 50 years of palynology processing, and they were completely intact, not only palynologically, but geochemically also. So essentially, if you have, if you work for a company and you have commissioned palynological work in the past, I really advise you to demand those bottles because they're essentially the kerogen of the rock at a very specific depth, at a very specific location that you would have to spend a lot of money reproducing if you wanted to get them again. So as I said, some companies have thousands and thousands of these residues, which are extremely useful. I mean, for TOC, for Delta 13C, for biomarkers, for palynology, you can literally get the bottle out and re reanalyze it. We, we never saw any evidence that sitting in the bottle for a few years has any effect on um, their use in the future. Uh, we have another question from Dr. Shadik Bhatt. Uh, sir, you can unmute yourself. Yeah. 
Mike, uh, this is uh, Shahid Iqbal from Pakistan Petroleum Limited. So, so there I'm not that Shahid. So I am from oh, PPL. So, okay. so okay. good to see you. I have, I have a question. Uh, actually, we are uh, chasing infra Cambrian and play in one of our area. So, uh, what would we do in infra Cambrian case where we don't have any Palino mouth? Uh, how do we correlate these uh, 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 carbon-13 isotopes? And my second okay. question is, uh, uh, we have a lot of erosion in the area as we go from the west to east, and we, we need to do a petroleum system modeling just to know uh, the uh, presence and maturity of the uh, organic matter. So how, how can we cor correlate uh, that in the eroded part above the infracambrian. And thirdly, the question is, can we do these analysis on the ditch cutting instead of cores if you don't have any core available? And what should be the uh, sampling interval? Okay, yeah, great questions. So infracambrian, so you're probably, you must be aware that the infracambrian Oman is a really important source area. So. You will know. Yeah, all exactly. That. Just, just I, I want to mention that it's the same in Fakambian that is uh, yeah. in the Oman and in Indian side we have discoveries in the, in this in Fakambian, yeah. but unfortunately in Pakistan we don't have. Okay, so 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 it's the stringers. Yeah, I mean the stringers in Oman. Yeah, these extra, extraordinary oil. So the Hukuf oil that I mentioned earlier on is from this age as well. It's the source rock. So, um, in fact. You may find there is there are palinomorphs. So uh, although un unless you've checked, uh, there are infracambrian palinomorphs, quite common ones in in the in Oman, for example. And if you're interested, I can send you papers to show work that was done on this. So Butterworth, for example, did some interesting work on um, infracambrian palinomorphs in 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 Oman. <laughs> So don't don't write it off. There may be palinomorphs which you can use to correlate. OK, um, so your delta 13 C values will be again dependent on the terrestrial organic uh, ratios. They will depend be dependent on um, large scale carbon cycle changes. I mean, I, I think what you'd have to do is I think it would be worth taking palynological samples through these units if you have them, and then doing palynology and delta 13C on them. It's only then when you get results will you be able to say, well, like I can identify this unit for whatever reason. It has a particular, you know, it has a particular characteristic in terms of its delta 13C value or its palynology. And you might be able to do that without actually trying it. Um, it's very difficult to say whether it would work or not. Um, I think in Oman it has worked. I mean, they have used various techniques. Your question on erosion. One of the problems with this is that for er erosion of organic material and reworking into later rocks, that's going to cause problems because, you, you know, if you have a, a delta 13C kind of signature from different parts of the stratigraphy, and if you have erosion and deposition and reworking, then it will smear or uh, affect that. One of the good things about palynology is because it's time significant, because palynomorphs are bound by time, you can tell when something is reworked because they're in the wrong place. And if organic matter occurs with the reworked palynomorphs, then you know the organic matter is reworked. But again, it can be difficult. I mean, again, I can only recommend that you try something, otherwise you'll never know if it actually works. In the end, it's very practical, this. It's not, you're not dealing with something high science, you know, you're dealing with something, does it work or not? If it doesn't work, forget it. You try it a little bit, if it works, then you keep going. The third question, ditch cuttings. This is a difficult thing to do with the cuttings because organic material is so mobile. I mean, it obviously can cave down the well, it can rework, 
but caving particularly. One of the great things about palynomorphs is that they, when they are caved, you can see them because they are in the wrong place. So, I mean, Ifan's nodding because he knows about this. So if you, if you're working in a sequence where you're clear, say you're in the infracambrian, you get a load of Cretaceous or Permian palynomorphs, say a load of stuff from the Tobra formation in your infracambrian, you, you know that you've got caving. So you know that your organic matter, if you're trying to measure it, the delta 13c value is going to be not correct because it's likely to be Permian organic matter if you've got Permian palynomorphs. So again, this is why palynology is important because it can, when you work to use the two together, um, they can help you tell whether you should ignore some figures or not. So I know I've not given you a very straightforward answer because it's not easy. You'd, you'd need to look at the sections, get someone to look at them and, that, and recommend a meth, you know, recommend a pilot study. See if it works. If it doesn't work, forget it. If it works, try it on something bigger. It's really practical, this, uh, Iqbal, it's, Dr. Iqbal. It's not um, high science. It's, you know, you just got to do it and see if it works. If it doesn't, forget it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your uh, comments. Uh, I will, I will be grateful if you can share that paper on Infocambrian, where we we, we can see these palynomorphs. Yeah, if, if you send me your email address, I will send you the paper. It's on Infocambrian palynomorphs. No problem. Okay. 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 Secondly, we we have done uh, recently a study, uh, pal uh, palynological study and biostratigraphy, uh, micropalynology and uh, uh, is, uh, nano paleontology. So, so we we did this study on the uh, ditch cuttings. Uh, you are very right that uh, we we find a lot of problems in this palynomorph analysis uh, on these ditch cuttings. But but these palynomorph, in addition to nano paleontology and uh, micro paleontology, gives uh, a good correlation between the wells. So, thank you very much. So uh, I will share my email uh, with Mukhtiar or anyone. Oh, so, uh, so you can please share that paper. Thank you. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have another question from Imran. Uh, Imran, can you please go on and uh, unmute your uh, mic? Uh, am I audible? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, very nice talk, uh, Mike. Uh, so, a brief introduction of mine. Uh, I am working as a postdoc uh, researcher here in China. So, uh, actually, it's uh, some comments rather than questions. Uh, just Shahid Bhai was asking about the Infria Cambrian succession of Pakistan. So, actually, I have been uh, doing some work uh, lately on these uh, salt range formation and uh, some, some younger succession. So uh, basically, there is a very well preserved acritage uh, within these. If you can, uh, if you can encounter some uh, shale beds, there are some some shale beds in the top of this infracambrian yeah. succession, and they have a very well preserved acritage. So what they can do is uh, they can uh, obviously there is a very well developed uh, biostratigraphy or uh, what what we can say a very well developed schemes. So acritage uh, study can help them to get the uh, age control, maybe. So another thing he was asking about uh, petroleum modeling. So actually, if you know, like um, uh, we normally use vitrinite reflectance uh, to uh, to get the, uh, uh, the effects of uh, erosion and other things. So in, in these infracambrian rocks, uh, we, we got some uh, bitumen. Uh, so actually, you were you were talking about bitumen in, in initially. So basically, what we believe there are uh, two type of bitumen. Uh, one is the bitumen that is produced by the migration of hydrocarbons, and one is the in situ bitumen. You were telling us about, uh, if you remember, like in your slide, uh, the biodegradation of organic matter that occur within uh, within the water column. So in in, in older rocks, especially in Precambrian. And uh, even Mesoproterozoic rocks, you will find some bitumen, which is very different from migrated bitumen. So normally, what we believe are uh, I have a very uh, I published one paper 
in coal geology related to that so what we believe that uh, they are just very similar to the vitrinite so we can use them as uh, vitrinite uh, we we can use uh, their measurement and get some uh, idea about the uh, the maximum temperature they were exposed to and that can be used for modeling so uh, i hope uh, this this these questions uh, of shared by are answered and thank you again for for this very nice talk thank yeah, you so much yeah. here, here's the um the paper that i mentioned i was just describing to dr iqbal which is um this this is just one paper from the infracambrian of uh, of um oman so you can see the kinds of palynomorphs that occur. I mean, these are quite difficult to do palynology with because they're very simple um, and they're not particularly distinctive. But again, it's a matter of being practical. You may decide, well, this sample has a large number of circular things in it and a large number of filaments in it. And that's enough to identify the unit. You don't have to give them fancy names or or anything like that. It may be that you can fingerprint a unit just because it has a particular form of acritarch or, or organic matter, oh, sorry, or palynomorph. I don't know if you can see this paper that I'm, I'm showing you. So these are... Yeah, yeah, I can see that. So these are very old. I mean, these are pre, pre land plant, so extremely old, but um, still useful. So I would uh, recommend that rather than write off um, or uh, dismiss the chance of um, using palynomorphs in the Precambrian, I, I would still consider doing it. I'd be happy to chat through this with um, Dr. Iqbal if he's interested. Yeah, my yeah. thank you. Please, if you can share that, I'll okay. go through that in detail. Okay. Uh, I believe, Mike, when we when when we were doing uh, palynology in uh, salt ranges in the in the Warsha Formation, we did not uh, necessarily come across any palynomorphs uh, there. But if you go to Oman uh, in the Ghari, for example, uh, you had been telling that, and we saw tremendous amount of palynology recovered. So, yeah, it, it, it might actually look slightly different when you when you look at the outcrops, but when you really study them, the, the result might be in a 180 degree to what you had been thinking before. Yeah, so, I yeah. agree. Yeah. If you were looking at the Garif, which is you know a major sandstone reservoir in uh, Oman and the equivalent in Unaza in, uh, in Saudi, it's terrible in the outcrops. You would never believe that it has any palynology in it, but when it's drilled, because you know you're dealing with very thin shaley layers, which can be really good for palynology. Um, you can use these shaley layers to do great palynology. Um, so you shouldn't go by what you see in the um, in the outcrop, as Irfan says. It's uh, it's not a good guide. First of all, you don't see the shales because they get weathered away, and secondly, even if you did see them, they often have lost their palynomorphs because they've been weathered away. So the best thing to do is to test, to run some cores through your watcher formations and see what they contain. You may move, you know, to another fascis a couple of kilometers away from the outcrop and find in the subsurface a really good, a really good assemblage. Yeah. Do we have any uh, anyone else to ask question or um, uh, any comment or uh, I think that's uh, that's all, uh, Mike. Uh, and I think uh, we would really like uh, to advertise our plans for the future. And um, we are planning uh, <clears throat> for uh, for some very high-ended uh, applied courses, uh, probably somewhere in April. In Pakistan, where Mike might visit, uh, uh, so so we might actually come with the with the updates on that. Uh, Mike, do you want to add something on this or? Uh... Yeah, it's a bit a bit early for me to say at the moment, uh, Ivan, but um, it's it's certainly my intention to you know develop a relationship with uh, 
with uh, the University of the International Karakoram University, for example, and Peshawar University. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, well, we'll see if that happens. We might actually bring uh, a few applied courses for industrial guys or uh, professionals from academia and Islamabad, and I'll be sharing the updates uh, uh, over and again uh, as 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 the the plan gets clear with time. So uh, I'll I'll let uh, everyone uh, go, and uh, I'll really appreciate. Uh, your presence, uh, your interactive uh, discussion. And uh, I really am thankful to Mike for uh, giving us time from his uh, really busy schedule. He had been in Jordan recently. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Thanks. And uh, uh, thank you, Irfan and Muktia, for organizing these great talks. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, you, you, I mean, uh, anyone, anyone, I, I mean, I actually get a lot of uh, messages from people who have been traveling are busy at some point, obviously, and not have been able to uh, attend the talk. So we would be putting this uh, talk on our uh, YouTube channel. So you can always go there and retrieve it and go through it again and again. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks.